Okay. Sure. Right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to session eight of Talk the Walks. Today's topic is working with generations. As usual, I'll start with my questions with the two gentlemen I have by side by side. Do you believe in generation differences? Is there any way of working differently? Do you believe in it? Okay, first of all, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, uh, there are generation differences, right, obviously. Uh, these differences, I think, uh, I, I personally, you can't put them into, say, slot saying millennials, you know, Gen X, uh, you know, Gen Y, Gen Z, Z and so on. Uh, because it depends on the, the environment that you live, right? Now, a Gen X or a Gen Y or even Gen Z from US, behavior of, uh, you know, uh, a person uh, in an environment like that may be different from a Gen X or Gen Y or Gen Z person in Sri Lanka. And also within Sri Lanka, right? Whether you live in Colombo or if you go to a remote area, it can be different because it depends on the things that you are exposed to, the technology, access to technology, right? Access to education and all that. Obviously, people are different. I mean, generate. If you look at from even um, traditionals to uh, baby boomers, right? Baby boomers to Gen X. All these people are different. So there are generation changes and within generations also, I mean, you can't, it's not right to generalize, right, or stereotype. Now you go to a new country, right, and, uh, and you meet, the first guy you meet is probably the immigration officer, right, and immigration officer doesn't treat you right. Do you form an opinion of the entire country, population of the entire country? I mean, we tend to do that, right? But that is not right. right? So you have to look at the, the individual's you know, characteristics and behavior uh, if you want to work with these people. Right? Wonderful start. I'll tell you, Dinesh, uh, do you believe, I'll come to the definition a little <laughs> later, but do you believe, or if I ask a question this way, just X, Y, Z, do they compete or complement? Uh, good morning again, everybody. So I come from a very uh, practical background. So for me, um, you know, working in my organization, I will try to draw some experience. And uh, I tend to agree with uh, Lalit a little bit because an organization is very difficult to plan your strategies, you know, plan your work, uh, kind of compartmentalizing this generation. So what we do is, uh, in one side, I think it's compliment for, for me, because uh, we want to get the best of people as, uh, as CEOs. And uh, so that really fit in our mantra of getting people to work together. And uh, we as leaders need to ensure that they don't compete each other as well. And it's not quite healthy for the organization. So there are a lot of experience, you know, and we are in, in the month of you know, year end and we are looking at our long range planning process as well. So what we did was we got a, um, you know, as leaders, you know, probably Gen X, uh, we have a set of, you know, aspirations, set of strategies that we need to drive for the industry, drive for the country, sorry, for the company and to the group. We also want to hear the voice of the younger generations called, you know, not necessarily Gen Y or Z, but we got a young talent we, the whole purpose of for them to come and challenge us. And the reason is once you start uh, getting them involved, uh, because Gen X said the strategies, one day Gen Y has to deliver it. So when you get them engaged at the early stage of formulating those, and there's a greater buy-in. So I see that happening and very contradictory views, uh, especially coming from the Gen Y on in work-life balance from the industry that I'm coming from, which is apparel, is quite challenging. And uh, so getting them engraved into that, that's what we did. We got about 12 to 15 young, smart grad. They have no rele relevance in experience in the industry. We want them to simply challenge the way we work. And uh, because we are moving from uh, being a manufacturer from B to B to B to C to now B to E, e-com business, 
and we need to kind of replicate the consumer behavior, consumer patterns, and we want to create consumer within the organization. So we felt this uh, uh, diversity in generation is kind of helping us and, and complementing as well. So we have a lot of experience uh, we can share as we go on. Right. I think uh, the opening uh, speech you did, I think it's very much fitting to your character because you are a person in this forum who has been dealt with many generations like because in your, in your uh, career. So with that in, in, in mind, I have a, again another challenging question to you. Uh, do their beliefs and uh, lifestyles, do you see them? I know that, that stereotyping is not mm. the way you want, but just mm. understanding the definitions we had in the industries. Do you see a huge difference when you go through these, pass through these generations in your, your, your life of your career? Yeah, so there are common things. Uh, obviously, the young people, since they are more exposed to technology, they like to get information mostly from devices, right? Close to their, you know, heart. But, I mean, how do we get information? We get information from books, right? Maybe television. Now, a lot of people don't even watch television. Right? So, the behavior and if you want to and communicate to them also, there are methods. If you want to train one of these people, the natural way of training is, you know, have a short course or a training program or a mentoring program or something like that, right? So, that's how we would like to do it. But sometimes a combination is the one that's going to work. That plus maybe some delivery of material through online means, right? Because these people I know, I have two young children, so they are in uni, so I know their behavior as well. So the way they listen to lectures, for example, and the way we want to deliver lectures may be different, right? We want to go to, a, I mean, we use multiple methods, right? I mean, still predominantly it's classroom teaching, right? classroom teaching combined with other things, right? Whereas a lot of these people don't even want to come to class, right? So how do we teach these people? For example, okay, so you need to have lecture recorded. And I know my son, for example, he doesn't, sometimes he doesn't go to class, right? So I don't want <laughs> you to tell these to our students. <laughs> I want students to come to class. <laughs> <laughs> But no, no, so we are changing, we are changing the way we are behaving because of their influence, right? So we record classes now, okay, so do we, do we want to have 80% attendance? Maybe we, we might, you know, do away with that because the way they want information is different. The way, the, you know, this long lectures in versus bite-sized information, right? So most, most of the information that you get, uh, on Facebook and WhatsApp and so on. It's just quick information. That is the way the, way the you know, that, uh, you know, the youngsters are used to. So I think there are, you know, uh, differences and, uh, and we need to recognize these and then customize our environment so that we can have an inclusive approach to all. Right. So here's another quick question to you, Dinesh. When you say that you see they complement and compete and the advantages from the board point of view, boardroom point of view, which generation do you live in? Uh, I don't know, they are my age, so <laughs> <laughs> obviously I'm, I'm on Gen X. I'm not questioning about the age, I'm yeah. questioning about the way you think. Think, yeah. I think uh, I, uh, it kind of influenced the way we think also, you know, uh, we get influenced by our consumers. And uh, traditionally, we have been a manufacturing company. So you, when you're in a manufacturing orientation, you always look at your know, cost efficiencies, productivity, human capital. Um, but uh, for last 10 years, I would say, not, not even 10 years, maybe seven to eight years, it's, it's highly influenced by the consumer. So we are now becoming a consumer-driven organization than a customer-driven organization. So you really un need to understand the thinking and the behaviors and lifestyles of consumers, you know, so the consumers can be in various generations. So when you cater to, you know, I, I cater to about 10 brands uh, of, of uh, um, intimate and performance apparel. 
so each brand has certain consumer profile so for when you run the organization you need to be cognizant to those profiles and you know to structure your design and development capabilities and so and so forth so for me i need to be mindful of across generation understand that from a consumer standpoint right ladies and gentlemen once again good morning i am anurudh alvis host of this program on to my left i have a researcher i have a well reputed character in our education industry of sri lanka and a lecturer a professor professor lalit gamage from sli it i'll, I'll in, ask them to introduce and talk about their history a little bit later but on my right hand side i have dinesh de silva who is the ceo of mass body line one of the largest garment factories in sri lanka and in india and the reason of these two gentlemen here dealing with 15000 employees of different generations catering to different generations tastes i'm sure maybe if, maybe close to 100000 by now the students that have total population maybe less than that but uh, we have over 8500 students at any given no time. i said total, entire yeah, entire would be about 50000 or so yeah so it's a large population Uh, of of lecturing and and teaching and generating giving them the kind of knowledge to different generations so that's a reason that's a similarity and the difference of both those people on my left hand side so i'll start with uh, lalit can you please explain or give a little bit of me details of your background why you passionate about what you do um, your your bit of your phd and the canadian uh, research and what's right now used so to p- people to understand what kind of leader you are Okay, so I start from my university life going without going back yeah. to school. <laughs> so I uh, graduated from University of Moratua, uh, uh, Electronic and Telecom Engineering. It was very hard. I won't ask anyone else at the time to do it again <laughs> because it's not easy. To, I mean, at the, at during my time, only 25 were taken from the entire country. So I was fortunate enough, but I also took a lesson from that. Um, so the uh, I thought one day that I would provide. more high education opportunities to a wider section of the society so that that's something that because today if you want to become an electronic engineer it is not so hard you can do it why are we you know having an exclusive approach to education i wanted to have an inclusive approach to education because there are so many children in this country who can do electronic engineering and contribute to our society right whereas what we want to do it from all level onwards we want to eliminate people we want to have an exclusive approach so i wanted to change that so that's why we disrupted the education system so coming back to my own so i graduated and i a very interesting story i don't know whether it's going to so i my seniors so it industry was just uh, developing in our country so uh, all the big, the good ones of uh, the, our, my senior batch they join this i don't want to name the name but they are still <laughs> in business this particular company and they were also attached to a multinational so my ambition was also at the time was to join this company because they were getting very high salaries when assistant lecturers of university of moratu was getting 1050 rupees a month <laughs> right these guys were getting 3500 so i thought that was good they were getting vehicles and so on so i wanted to join this company so they had lots of tests uh attitude test attitude test battery <laughs> test right attitude test battery test and so many tests and after a while i was given this package i was so happy medical covered three that i said i'm going to live the life that i want right <laughs> came and gave it to my i i meant was my head of the department lecture i gave it to him so i got this job he said really do you really want to go right why don't you stick around and uh, we we just started computer science department at the time why don't you join us one of the first members of the computer science and engineering department of moratua part had an agreed so uh, i was at moratua university then obviously then i chose a different career i wanted to you know anyway i had always i wanted to be an academic so all, after working in industry i still wanted to come back so took the uh, that challenge and uh, so i was uh, given this scholarship to study uh, 
at the University of British Columbia. Again, I must tell you, so I wanted to do this, um, at the time artificial intelligence, uh, computer vision was you know, coming up, I wanted to do that. Then my opportunity came, so this is the difference between some of the differences between our generation and <laughs> you know the young crowd today you know when you set a mind i i, I don't think there is any difference so you wanted to do that you don't want to deviate from it right this is what i want to do and i want uh, until i get that i won't move whereas in my case so the opportunity came from mechanical engineering department right of university of british columbia so i thought hard i mean you don't have money to spend and do your own thing so I accepted that, but then I went there and changed that, right, so that I could do what I wanted to do. So ultimately the project that I did for my research was based on computer vision. It's actually developing a machine, a fish processing machine, right, and they were wasting like five million dollars a year because of, you know, processing inefficiency and I could save four and a half million dollars a year, right, by using computer vision and artificial intelligence. So that's how I did my PhD and a lot of people did not want me to come back. I mean, all my colleagues, I think one guy, another guy who came back who was also at UBC was Professor Malik Ran Singh who came and became the Vice Chancellor of Morotu as well. So we came back and we uh, developed, uh, you know, various programs at Morotu, especially computer science program. And then, I will stop after saying this, then I saw the need for IT professionals. The industry was struggling, begging for IT professionals. When Morotua was producing, our first batch was 16, mm. then we increased it to 25, right? These numbers were not going to make any dent in the industry, right? Industry was asking for thousands. So then we realized that we, don't, we needed to do something. That's when I wrote the proposal to start SLIT. So that's how you know SLIT came to being. Then I resigned from Morotu and since then I've been with SLIT. One of the best decisions you made, <laughs> I think. And I think there are a few uh, of your <laughs> students here, yeah, sure, yeah, students yeah. here. <laughs> Turn into you, uh, Dinesh. Tell us about yeah. your career. Where do you start? I, I don't know how to start listening to uh, Lalit's uh, story, <laughs> really inspirational. So. I was not fortunate to get into university, so um, I'll start from my, after my A-levels, you know, and um, coincidentally I started SIMA, you know, no, no, no great plans, you know, tried few things, you know, um, I actually my first job was when I was 18 and I started in a computer firm and, um, but one thing I learned from my first job, you know, back in when I was 18, 19 is, you know, if you are given something, I, I create a passion for it, you know, I, you know. Uh, you know, simple things starting from there. Then I completed me, my SEMA and uh, I became a FCMA about 15 years back. And uh, then I kind of, in the whilst working, uh, I studied. I spent about four years at Ernst Young. I consider that as my university experience and a uh, very humble beginning. Uh, great place uh, to start for accountants and uh, to future, you know, management accountants, you know, a lot of experience. Uh, spent two years in financial auditing and two years in management accounting. And then I uh, started looking around for opportunities and I was uh, kind of half completed my uh, professional qualification. I'm doing my finals on SEMA and I was looking for an opportunity and I saw this uh, company is calling for assistant accountants and uh, I still have that uh, advert with me quite uh, inspiration when I look back now and uh, so I, I what interested me was uh, apparel was kind of you know kind of booming in, in at that time about 25 years ago and uh, so that really interested me it's a new company setting up outside Colombo I, I like the, the way it was advertised you know long story short you know I started there as an accountant and uh, so again you know the work I got I had, I had great leaders supporting me coaching and mentoring you know at that time there's no nothing called mentoring but you have the leaders you know they support you everything what you do and um, I kind of continue on consistency is, you know, whatever the responsibility came to me, I, I took with a passion, you know, I kind of, I want to disrupt whatever I was doing. 
and I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. You know, if it's something bothering me, I can how do you computerize and you know take it off from that. And uh, so you know, with that, you know, I got the opportunity to grow with the company, and, and I started at Bodyline, and my first you know commercial uh, you know kind of uh, experience. And uh, so I became an accountant, the management accountant, and then I began the financial control. And you know, <coughs> this is the time that uh, MS is looking for overseas expansion. So, being a young accountant, we also got a lot of opportunity to work with leaders, the board members, uh, the foreign uh, joint venture partners, writing proposals, <coughs> you know, putting you know cash flow statements, getting approval from BOI, you know, sitting in board meetings, and you know, got a lot of hands-on experience working with very diverse leadership from chairman of the company to the customer to the buyers to and so and so forth. So at the age of 28 I got the opportunity to one of our facilities was setting up in India and I was part of feasibility studies and putting those papers and I never expected after four years to go and give leadership uh, as a senior you know senior person and I was kind of acting CEO at the age of 28 and uh, that really turned my career I would say you know then I started creating passion for people working with people and that was my last finance job in 2000 I shifted my uh, background from finance HR to uh, becoming more leadership role and uh, spent about 10, 10 years at Bodyline and moved out of Bodyline and at that time MS was setting up uh, MS was known for intimate apparel and we saw there's opportunity for sportswear. You know, we kind of uh, looking at a you know separate division to uh, to focus on sports apparel. And uh, so I was called uh, on a, on a one of the evenings, and you know, why don't you take the operations leadership? So, and uh, that really gave me the opportunity of uh, you know to building companies, building manufacturing units uh, in Sri Lanka for apparel. So started about one facility and end up with about putting up over 10 facilities and working with you know recruiting leaders you know working with them giving them the guidance and you know to support in them was really inspired me and uh, so i did about uh, five to six years on that then i came back to the uh, central organization supporting a mess uh, head office and to uh, take a concept of lean manufacturing. It's a Toyota production system, so I got a flair for manufacturing excellence through my experience. Then um, move across the organization as a role for setting up lean enterprise across the globe for MS holding, working out of central organization for about five to six years. A lot of experience in bringing and working with a lot of consultants, bringing that knowledge to the organization, setting up our own a lean institute uh, uh, um, within the organization we have turned around about about 3000 graduates from that internal academy uh, who kind of spend most of their time on the improvements and process improvements and change in the way we work and um, for the last three years i'm back at my first company and uh, never planned and uh, so after 10 12 years i came back to my first company which is bodyline for last three years, uh, I'm there as a CEO for Sri Lanka and India. So it's a great place to be there. So you have a lot of sentiments and background to the organization coming back. And uh, you can't you use the same lens that you left the organization. You have to think from a very different uh, uh, landscape. And it's a very competitive market now. And uh, so when I left, it was more manufacturing driven. When I came back, it's very much consumer-driven organization. It's a huge transformation from a manufacturing-led organization to a consumer-led organization. So, um, so now for the last three years, I'm, I'm working with them. I'm also sits at the MS uh, Apparel Board, uh, responsible for a group role as well. So that has been my experience. Yeah, thanks for the introductions. And uh, for the clarity for the audience, uh, just as a clarity, Generation X, we refer 19, the people who born between 1965 to 1976. And 77 to uh, 97, we call Y and millennials start from there. And 97 onwards, we call Z, right? Just for clarity. Um, now, I would like to ask a question. Because you said this earlier, Dinesh, you sit in the board representing at least traditional definition of X writing the vision 
and you said it's converted now from a, a more manufacturing to consumer driven yeah. organization and you still sit in the board how do you set that vision that will be driven by millennials how do you how do you read the minds of them uh, as i said you know you know i'll draw some experience from where i sit in the, in the in the company we do you know the directions come from the board which we kind of collectively kind of frame those things and again kind of percolate to the each division so as a ceo of the organization when i came on to the board uh, of body line and um, so we were changing you know our marketplace is changing we are very successful uh, probably one of the most profitable division of MA. So you have a kind of, and 25 years old, and uh, so you have a kind of a legacy. You have a, a generations working there, so their mindset is different. They are so successful. Why do you need to change? And actually, we own by our customers. Uh, Victoria Secret is own one third, and in another brand called Tramp International own one third of this organization. And both these customers are changing as customers, and, and they don't look at as a, a, a kind of a, they look at as as a, their investment. They don't influence the way we work. We have to compete for our own business. So, um, so it's very important to understand the you know tipping point. You know, I should have continued for three years, five years. I know that the success of what we had about four years ago will definitely continue. Organization don't go through you know rut so easily. Uh, a successful organization so we kind of started looking at what needs to change in the organization and uh, when you have a diversity in the organization I'm coming back to the same organization so I see the same people who've been doing the same job doing the same job after 10 years as well so so we started looking at what is our differentiation that we want to bring what is our core competency that we are looking at what is our strength weaknesses and opportunities we have so we kind of articulate about eight strategies for the organization. We got some you know, feedback from our customers, feedback from our own kind of stakeholders. You know. So we redrafted our kind of vision for the organization. And in each of these uh, uh, interactions, uh, one thing I was very clear to get the voice of the you know, younger generation. You know, I, didn't, I didn't bother with this X or Z, but I thought that in the upcoming who's challenging, who doesn't take uh, no for an answer, and who want to think out of the box. You know, the, when you think of it in the new generation, they, they, they like to take risk. They like to uh, explore opportunities. They are quite savvy in what, you, what, what they do. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, probably X generation or the older generation, you know, they, they like to win a box. So we want to encourage to people to think out of the box. And also we want to people to do whatever they are doing extremely well. So you, you need to have a, a, a core has to be strengthened, which is our manufacturing. And we also need, need to look at the new diversification for the organization. So this blend actually works very well in the organization in, in terms of articulating vision, the articulating values and culture that we want to embrace as an organization. So, and then it comes to the communication, you know, so how do you communicate this, you know, so we got, you know, cross section of people which has all generation, you know, driving that behavior. So, and I think that inclusivity is what really drove yeah. us for last three years to drive one message, one voice across the organization and, and make everyone part and parcel of it. Have we achieved that journey? Not yet. So it's a long journey for us to grow, changing yeah. the whole organization from a mindset, the culture, and the way we look at it from a, from a manufacturing team to a consumer driven. So we, everybody needs to look at who's our consumer, who's our internal customer, who's our external customer, to whom are we producing for, you know, what is the, what is the value they have? Is it the cost and quality alone, or is it the sustainability? So you have to kind of embrace those uh, diversity, uh, uh, and you have to bring that thing into the organization. Right. And uh, so that's kind of a, a you know journey that we go through. So uh, turning to you now, hearing from sitting in the board and, and listening to the needs of the customers and the different generations, I have an opposite question. Mm -hmm. Working with number of generations or, or a couple of generations together and thinking for them because education has to always think future how the future thinks because you have got different people how hard is for you to push the gen, gen x people working with you because they will not go out of comfort zone is it a, is it a problem for you sure like i said you know 
we've been working with generations right throughout. Now, if you look at when we were young, right, young assistant lecturers, we had to work with our next generation, right? And I don't actually, that, like I said, I don't want to put people into, but always working with another generation, whether it is Gen X or whatever, I mean, some Gen I might come. Right? So you need to be able to understand the environment that they are in and, you know, understand their value systems and so on and, you know, cater to them. So uh, one thing that uh, I like to say is, uh, and also drawing some of the examples from my experience at Morotu and, you know, government universities, uh, if you permit me to say this actually, um, that is, you know, why some of these issues um, at universities, if you really understand, it is, I think the point that you made as well, it is lack of communication, both ways, right? People do not understand what the management wants. Students do, do not understand. Or we have not at least communicated that to them well, right? And we don't also, management does not understand what they want, right? So I have seen this starting an institution grounds up. When we were very small, it was very easy for me to go and talk to students. I knew each and every student because we started with 394 students at BOC Merchant Tower, right? Next year, we had another 600 coming in, so 1,000. All of a sudden, I saw how the institution grew. Then I needed to change mechanisms, right? So that our, our thinking is properly communicated to the you know the students not just students but also the other people so the staff also grew right so in that how do we uh, you know address some of these we always it, as i said it's always an inclusive approach right so we have students coming on to our various boards right we have uh, every month we meet with the students right and hear them out right what they want because sometimes what they want may not be what you want to, you know, deliver, right? So, because of this, we, I can tell you that we haven't had a single day of closure because of student issues, <laughs> touch wood, right? <laughs> so, because we understand them and whatever that is needed for them because we are there to provide education for them and in the best possible way and produce professionals who can contribute to the you know society and the economic development of the country and beyond right so i think that communication understanding whether they are generation x or generation y so we have so many people right and we have always um, you know the generation gap has you know widened you know when when i started <laughs> i was also a part of them now i i may be two generations away from them but that does not matter as long as you are tuned to their needs. Right? Let me let me interrupt you. Yeah. So the question turns to it's not the students yeah. working with those lecturers who are in the previous generation not listening. Is it hard? No, lecturers also you communicate to the lecturers as well. So you know lecturers have also you know grown with the system, right? So you, you are referring to younger, uh, young, young older generation, older generation lecturers. Correct. So, so obviously we have programs to, you know, change our mindset. Now, let's say for example, this I remember very well. Uh, again, going back to Moroto University uh, days. Now we uh, had, uh, you know, year long. Now today you have semester based systems, right? So I was in the committee to change from uh, year long, uh, you know, exam, year long years, basically academic years to semester based system. And lot of, so I had just returned after my PhD, so a lot of seniors, you know, were against this because they have, it's continuous assessment, you have to mark more, this is all, right? You have to mark, marking is the worst thing in any, if you ask any lecturer, right? Because students write all kinds of things, right? You have to read all that and somehow, you know, fish out the ones that are, you know, relevant. So, uh, so they were against this, but we managed to somehow tell them stories, bring examples from other places and we change the mindset of those people. So today we have 
So similarly, even at SLIIT, when we want to change something, look, we br first bring a lot of examples why we are doing this, right? And somehow convince them that this is something that is necessary. Can tell you this uh, the thing about you know video recording of lectures, right? A lot of lecturers did not like this, especially the senior ones, because someone can listen to it, <laughs> you can make a mistake, and that mistake is there forever, right? <laughs> But this needs more preparation, more work for them, right? But somehow we brought a lot of experience, brought my, you know, children's examples, how they learn and so on, and somehow convinced them to do it, right? So that's, I think you have to not just tell them in an authoritative way, but you have to convince them bringing examples and why somehow convince them how that is going to affect the lives of students. Absolutely. Right? Wonderful answer. So, I know that it has gone longer than expected for questions. So, now I love immediately questions from the audience. I do not see many questions coming on the online app. What I hear from what you say is you, instead of changing the next generations, what you have done is you have made the older generations adapt to the changes that are happening. Is that true or that's not one? And number two is the communication method that you have used when you started to now. The media of communication, have you changed it or is it the same thing? So, first question first. By the time I answer the first question, I might forget the second question. So, at least <laughs> my, my, so I think it's both ways. You know, you, why do you want to change anyone? Because they are who they are because of the environment that they are in. You can't change that, right? So then obviously you have this older generation, right? They are also who they are, right? And how do we bring, you know, you have to somehow, you know, deliver this task of lecturing or educating uh, the students. So how do we do in the best possible way? So in what, in a sense, Obviously, because Dinesh was talking about customers, students are our customers, right? You need to change according to customer behavior, right? Unless you do that, they will go somewhere else, right? So, we have, as I said, we have somehow, and also one thing is when you work with students all the time, this is what I say, I would like to stay with students because you never age. Because you are always with the students, because they bring a lot of new things to you. And if you stay connected, you are always with them. So it is not very hard for you to change. And also you see that obviously we have training programs, mentoring programs and so on. We send them overseas to look at, because generally other universities elsewhere, especially in developed countries, they change before us. So we, since we have lots of partnerships with these uh, universities, so those changes happen almost immediately at SLIT as well. So I guess uh, that's the first um, the question. The second question was uh, the communication. So obviously I couldn't, because those days I used to go, to, I don't know, uh, he was there, Chapuranga is, uh, uh, so I don't know when, when you were there, I used to go to classes and talk to students every semester at least a couple of times, right? But now I can't do it because if I do that, I'll be doing day in, day out every day, right? <laughs> so I, what I do is I have different tiered structure, right? From faculties to departments to student advisors to student consultants to, you know, various mechanisms, right, uh, mentors, right, uh, and through student bodies like Student Interactive Society, right, to deliver our message to students, right, and then again through Student Interactive Society, so we don't co call it a union, we call Student Interactive Society. The, the meaning of that is you interact, the society interacts with students as well as the management, right? So br they bring the, you know, they, they bring their requirements and we always tell them, look, we are here to educate you, 
and we make this teaching learning environment better for all of us. So that's the message that we deliver and that has worked well for us. Any questions to probably Dinesh needs a good question. <laughs> Dinesh, uh, yeah. so being in the apparel industry, you have to deal with um, you know lots of people from sort of more rural areas. Um, you know, the, the, um, how do you deal with that? Do you see any differences in getting them aligned to your vision? Generations aside, how do you deal with that sort of more? Uh, more you want to change organizations' sort of vision from the manufacturing to you know, more customer led but they are coming from a background where, you know, this kind of stuff is, yeah. how do you deal with that? I think a great question, you know, that is something um, we kind of inter internally challenging ourselves as well. Because if you look at the, at a kind of associates level, you know, we, we don't call them uh, machine operators anymore. We were very uh, respectful for them, you know, as an organization also, because they are the income generators to us and, you know, and, uh, we call it team members, so uh, so we kind of move that you know social stigma of a you know juki operator to a team member. You know we are very respectful to do that, and it was a huge transformation in the organization. I was quite fortunate to kind of formulate in that transformation in the organization in my previous role uh, of you know did a lot of work through empowerment, and um, but what is remaining as a challenge is they are very short term oriented. And uh, so the challenge is to retain them during the first three years of the, in their employment. Sometimes they come just, they have a very simple personal vision because they, they want to find a certain level of income to do their next level of education. Maybe a, maybe a beauty culture, maybe a, something to, you know, to have a self-employment for them. And uh, it's not an industry that, you know, everybody love to join, you know, in the spectrum probably apparel may come quite, uh, you know, at, at, at a lower level. So, as an organization, we address this in multiple levels. It's one as an industry, we want to kind of elevate them and, uh, and the industry is doing a lot of work and we, we know that uh, we are moving on, on the upscale of the economy as well. And uh, so, we need to be very mindful of what is the living wage for these people. And brands also put a lot of pressure on, not because of brands, but we feel that is the right way to do it. So, um, so retaining them on the first three years is challenging. So, we bring various methods of retaining them. You know, one is the communication is very important. And uh, so, we are very respectful for them from the day one that they come to for even an interview. And we don't want to keep them for more than three hours. And uh, we look at kind of shortening that to them. You know, the new new, new generation is very young. When they come, you know, they, they, they come to explore. They just come for interview to see. And they're just sometimes, you know, they come during their A-level <laughs> period because they come from the rural. And uh, so they have very personal aspiration in their first three years. You know, they just come and see whether it's the right place for you to be there. So we need, that is our captive audience. And we really want to capture that their attention span in that time you know so we try to do a lot of things in terms of giving opportunity for them to do a self-employment and to you know expand their knowledge beyond what they do and make the job is interesting for them so uh, you know cost is a challenging for the industry so we used to have supervisors in the good old days now we have a team leaders so we identify good potential leaders from that group so we give find that you know identify a uh, team leader for about six to eight people of team members so, so the, you have get elevated within three years if you are good so you have the you know otherwise in the good old days in the industry you had to be about five years six years to become a supervisor they call it so we kind of kind of um, cut that crap and we want to give a aspiration for these uh, young uh, team members who are joining at the lowest level within three years we want them to be a good team leader the moment they get to a team leader, they start solving their own problems. And uh, so we teach them various tools uh, from a lean background. We tell them what are the five whys, you know, how do you break a problem. And we kind of create a kind of empowered work teams. So in a, in a, in a larger module, which we have about, we used to have 50 team members working in one module, we broke that, you know, various methods through automation, etc. So we have brought the modules to about 25. So in that you have a three, three teams working. 
So this whole empowerment program of a team leader, group leader concept uh, that we apply and we em embrace from, from Toyota Manufacturing and has really helped them to be motivated to be there. So in our industry, we have a, a kind of a turnover of about, uh, about uh, with a good in, the, in our company, we have a turnover about 8%, so we, we run about 3 to 4%, so we, which we believe is a good healthy place to be at. Then we have, uh, uh, in terms of communication, um, we have various forums, we have a joint consultative committees we work, we, we want them to decide their own mean plans, you know, we kind of have certain boundaries, we appoint uh, transport leaders, you know, they lead their transport route to make sure that everybody comes on time, so we kind of use those small groups to kind of penetrate that knowledge at the team member level, so your question is on team members, so we have various programs. And uh, apart from that, we have a lot of um, you know, training programs that we do for them, not necessarily work related. And uh, the latest being, you know, a lot of girls came and asked us, you know, sir, you know, we have been here, um, it's a great place, but we know that we, there's, a, there's a limit that they can progress also because, it's a, you know, your bottom is so, so big. So for them to rise to uh, executives, we, by the way, we have team members who have become directors in the organization, like a supervisors who have become directors in the organization. We have seen that progression. So we always give that opportunity. I always believe 70-30. 70% we want to harness the talent and the growth within the organization. 30% I believe is bringing from the out, out is healthy for the organization. I have my experience about 60 to 40, 60 to you know, 30 to 70. So. We conduct these uh, programs for them from their general leadership. So we believe, you know, you build leaders at, across all levels. It's good for the organization for sure. But when they go out to the society, we make some uh, difference in the way they work as well. So we conduct this, uh, you know, mass scale training for them. You know, it's very voluntary. Uh, th there's no job restriction uh, at that level. So they come and you know, learn. We saw that a lot of enthusiasm at that level, more than executives actually, I would say. Because executives, they get their education from their parents and also these people, as, as Lalit said, they are, they are huge, you know, humongous talent in the, in the country, but we need to tap to that. So as an organization and corporate citizen, we need to understand their needs as well. So we conduct this program um, last year, but 500 attended and I was quite passionate about their interest and the enthusiasm and you know, looking at their notebooks. And I said, you know, okay, what, what next? And uh, so we said, you know, we'll have a kind of a test paper end of the day and uh, let's get the best 10 students and give a, award a scholarship for them. And uh, so that kind of changed the, the whole landscape for the organization and they, they started believing in the organization. They, they know that, you know, they get a reasonable income, they get a, a steady employment, they get their, uh, you know, like a benefits that they get. We are quite uh, ethical the way we run and our standards are quite world class but apart from that you know when they saw you know the organization is doing something for yourself and I always encourage uh, you know call them and say that you know you need to have a dual income because we work on two shifts so you know half of the day they are idling so we try to bring a lot of education it could be you know patchwork the uh, kind of you know professional tailoring, uh, tailoring classes uh, holy culture and things like that for them. So that has really helped us to interact and even also to uh, create communication channels to uh, get, get to those uh, uh, team members as well. Okay. What interests your job? <laughs> Simple answer. Salary, the rewards, satisfaction. <laughs> what interests your job? Simple as. Sorry? I get to do the things that come naturally. What make you interest in your job? I'm doing what I like, what I want to do. Right. So, uh, who I'd like I'll to ask a question. Okay. Uh, from all these people, they <laughs> basically echo the same thing. What if you are asked to do something else? I make it fun. Hmm? I make it fun. I think it might sound uh, a bit weird, but everything has a way of getting done. Even if you don't like it, there are ways to 
make it fun. Mm. So, that I have actually... How about others responding? From diversity and inclusion perspective, how about females response? <laughs> Yeah, basically this amounts to pushing you outside your comfort zone, right? How are we reacting to that? Are you comfortable with it? You take it as a challenge? Challenge, right? Huh? Right. The question is basically, uh, with the limited time, we'll go with sh short questions. Mm. So to ask that. Okay, I'll expect very short, maybe ten questions, quickly, one by one. What do you, uh, sorry, yeah. what do you uh, see the difference of rewarding between the generations? Does all money matters? Or satisfaction. I what think right across in my experience. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Money, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> money matters, right? Okay. I can tell you that, right? Thanks right. for the honest answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, no, I'm not saying just for me. You I'm saying for right. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, I think, but then, I think a um, lot of young people today, uh, they, uh, like what you said, you like to do, you know, what you like to do, right? And uh, you want um, maybe sort of young people instant rewards. It's, it's the way, you know, the whole system works today, right? And you put up something on the Facebook, you want to see how many likes are there for that, right? <laughs> that is, <laughs> right? That's the culture that we live in, right? So, uh, I think career development is one of the important things that youngsters uh, think today, right? As opposed to, you talk about older people, it's because they are old, they may be looking at how do I get my best retirement package. What's he right? talking to him, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, <wait. laughs> no, wait. He's talking to you, not me. I'm just saying, maybe me, right? <laughs> so, so, there, so, career development, what career opportunities are there? You know, if you are not doing the right kind of thing that you you want to do, how how what what opportunities do I have in my organization to switch my careers? Things like those are the ones that I think young people like, and how they can be rewarded, mm -hmm. right? And recognition is also very important. Mm -hmm. right? So older generation, it's more static now, right? So they they like remuneration, maybe promotions, you know. Things like those. I forgot the question now. <laughs> <laughs> Work-life balance. Do you have? Uh, I think the more than work-life mm. balance, the work-life collaboration is what mm. matters. So the. So sorry for calling. This there is no separation. Trying to put people into the cage and kind of in, it's not that. But from the perspective of different generations, mm. that's the young generation or millennials. Do they have a work life balance? Do you think? I think they need the diversity. That's what I have seen. And uh, definitely, I think they want to explore. And uh, they want to, um, in, their, in their mind, you know, they, they come to the organization very new. No, no strings attached. Uh, no hierarchies for them. And uh, they don't care who's the CEO. And I think they want that experience. And that's what I have seen. And uh, we are working on e-com platform, and we are very mindful of that. We don't want to put the you know the guys like us who have been in the industry for so many years. We think in the box, and we want the you know the youngsters to lead the e-com platform for us. So I think uh, coming back to that, I think they need that um, kind of uh, diversity in that experience, and uh, they 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 want a uh, uh, support for uh, uh, rewarding and, and supporting failures and, and they want uh, somebody to be there to hear them and, and kind, of, kind of mentor and coach them at times when they have challenges, I have seen that and give that kind of a space for them to work and they are little introvert at times but uh, they, they like their, their space of freedom. 
so i don't know whether is a is a is a what kind of a balance i think uh, i have a very young uh, executive working for me and he's very fast and um, i know you send an email you get the response within 5 5 minutes you know so i i i wonder what it that work life balance and i'm trying to understand the in the millennial what is their work life balance because you send and you as uh, lalit said you know they are very 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 socially connected and uh, they don't have kind of a time bound on their interaction with the outside world and the technology so tech because of the technology obviously so um, so for me uh, life work life balance is 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 it's kind of personally i can't define for myself and everything is kind of integrated now how do you prioritize your your work is what matters sometimes you have to work on sunday sometimes you have to be with a customer on a poya day and uh, at the same time i want to be with my daughter uh, during her you know class teachers meeting or other uh, performance she does and it's same for the uh, the younger generation as well you know flexi hours is something they like it so we have in the organization we are calling that you we are encouraging in maybe another two years or one years down the line we are encouraging people to work from anywhere in the organization uh, so you can you use it you this this chai is is kind of embedded with uh, technology you can come and swipe here then we know that you know you are you know x is working in this chair for so many hours you know so kind of bring that diversity is something that i am um, we are working on maybe uh, my last question then i'll open one or two questions from the audience last question to you taking a cue from what he said do you believe the sri lankan education system cater for the this exploring type of generation <laughs> <laughs> so i think uh, sri lankan education system in my opinion i am not scared to say this needs a complete overhaul i think um, uh, uh, i mean primary and secondary we think that we have very edu- good education system but look at the kids from the day they are born you touched a very sensitive subject i mean it might take another <laughs> hour for me to but i can tell you you know from the day one that they are you know in school what do we what do we want the parents the kids they want to pass that a level exam right how do we change this mindset so they are so you know they are so tunnel vision one track minded right and everything around the family right even the parents don't socialize because my i had to take my daughter to class my son to class and so on right so that is why this whole education and we don't let other you know the students to learn other things so sports for example is considered something not good because that consumes time so some other uh, you know extra curricular activity is not considered because you want to get this a level exam you pass this a level exam or go to some university i think in time we have to change that and in time to come because of the availability of other higher education opportunities like i said during my time 25 so how do you how do you ask a child to you know do that i mean it would have been just luck for me right so what i'm saying is if you have more opportunities if you want, if if there if there are enough higher education opportunities to those who are qualified to enter a university in this country or even otherwise right uh, then you don't have to worry so much about that then the whole you know it has to work from there onwards right to the you know the lower levels primary level so that kids are you know diverse in their thinking right and and i think that our value system has deteriorated so much today right even when you drive a car you want to get on to the main road how many people will stop and allow you to uh, get your car on to the main road do we have that it is we have been driven by so much of competition Right. So the value system has it. Everything has it because of this. So I think that's why I said we need to completely overhaul Change. our primary, secondary, and tertiary education systems. Okay. So while we appreciate questions, the questions coming online as well. There's online question I'll read out, which are whoever want to answer, but quick answer, given the time. When it comes to Gen, basically the question is if Gen Y is leading Gen X. Uh, 
Is there but a posi positivity or negativity? How do you manage that? Gen Y leading Gen X. I, as I said, I don't, I don't want to say, you know, hard <laughs> things like that. It yeah. can be Gen X leading, Gen Y or Gen Y leading, and there is no, nothing wrong in either way, right? So that is my answer to it. It depends on your leadership qualities, right? How it, it is not an individual from a particular, you know, group. How, what kind of leadership qualities you have, whether you are in Gen X or Gen Y or Gen Z. Your my answer is, uh, I think, uh, yes, I, I believe, you know, right person has to give the leadership. That person can come from anywhere uh, for the right job, for the right reason, right attitude, uh, lead it. And I have, you know, my, my board, I have, a, you know, um, Gen Y uh, leaders and uh, the way they look at it, they take the ownership is very different to someone else. So until I came for this session, I, I never had a distinction between X, Y, Z, <laughs> and I consider all of them. But as, as leaders, we know that their thinking is different, their beliefs are different, their values are different, how they look at the world is different, and the risk appetite is different. And um, we as leaders need to be understand that and put the right person to the right job. And that is my job. Can I add something? Uh, Go ahead. This is different though. I wa so you might ask, okay, we said uh, leadership qualities. What are these leadership qualities? In my view, I want to say what a leader should possess, right? I think leader should be able to vision something, right? This is my vision, right? And in order to achieve that vision, you need to be able to develop a strategy. And then you get people, whether it is from Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, you need all types of people to execute this strategy. I think that's what a leader is. One more question I love from the audience. Most interesting yes. question, you'll get a copy. Uh, uh, well, apparently, uh, the apparel industry needs more creativity, right? And uh, you said a lot of uh, students from who are just after A levels and 18 or 19 years would be coming to a company for seeking the job opportunities. They might come with a lot of uh, different different ideas, uh, great kind of like vision and stuff, but it will kind of seem to others uh, in the static generation, it might seem like uh, quite uh, attitudes and uh, you know, uh, thinking out of box, it might come as a bit of like, uh, with a lot of attitudes, problems and such. So, according to you, would you like uh, try to get the best out of them with their potentials or you'd rather turn them to adopt your system? How would you deal with that? I always believe the voice of the people, you know. So, one way is we, we you know, if you look at MS holding tagline is change is courage. Uh, the one thing that really uh, kept us going is change. So I think uh, whoever comes to the organization, I'll talk about you know, people like you all. It's, it's the, for me, for being with the organization, I, I've done about eight jobs. This is my eighth uh, responsibility. We lived in an in, in era of change. So change is the only thing that motivates us. So that is the underlying uh, DNA of the organization. The second thing is we, we always encourage, so I believe and we believe, the leadership believe the best person who can give a, a solution for a problem is the person who is doing the job. Not me, not the consultant. So we encourage people to kind of challenge their job. The fear is, they fear that if you kind of challenge my job, whether I will be redundant. So I think you need to bring certain, you know, mechanisms to kind of make sure that, you know, they, they, they continue to give that suggestions. Uh, it's not just a suggestion scheme per se. And when you have a problem, how can they solve their problem? Solving problems is where the innovation comes. Thinking out of the box will come. Uh, uh, you, you kind of uh, uh, move away the fear of failure. So, and they pe feel part of that problem, part of that small team. So, we encourage uh, people to you know, come and give new ideas. We conduct very exclusive uh, innovation exhibition in, in MAs we get about 10 to 15,000 suggestions and it can be a very small change that we do and to a change from automation. We send that a team leader level, team member level who, you know, working on future stars, you know, we've got this whole talent show concept embedded with a suggestion schemes. 
so we identify the people who bring the best suggestions we run that and you know kind of get to a grand finale in each plant and we send the first team uh, coming you know the who win the first place we send them to the singapore and uh, so we have set about 25 teams across the organization to given this about 100 people I got this opportunity to go and see something that they had never dreamt uh, of in their life to go and see something outside Sri Lanka at that level. So likewise across the organization we create a, a culture of innovation and uh, we invested in that. Uh, we have been trained as leaders to think innovation out of the box and uh, allow people to uh, learn, uh, fail fast, fail cheap and we have a lot of encouragement is going for people to come up with new new ways of working right any other questions or one last question from Dinesh so I think in your organization mid senior level you will have gen x and gen y combination do you uh, plan training and development differently for to cater to different generations because uh, the older generation I think or the gen x would, would prefer classroom type trainings Whereas Gen Y probably would like uh, online and uh, more engaging yeah. type of training. So is it consciously done? Planned no, differently? I don't think we do it consciously. But now the whole the training, as Lali said, it has evolved, and uh, we have uh, various program for emerging leaders, uh, emerging executives. So we bring a lot of you know diversity within that. You know, so the program is kind of uh, tailored that uh, we spend uh, I think we, we, we go by uh, 70, 20, 10 rule and of training people now 70 percent is on the job we give a different experience to them either they have to be part of the you know you know work team and that uh, work team could be something to relate to the work or something relate outside the work so we encourage an organization that started this year we want people to go and spend about 500 man days in the organization do something completely out and we give uh, a, a paid leave for that within the framework that we had defined on the social work etc so i see a lot of people coming and bringing their projects and we fund for some some of that we encourage people to have a fundraising but uh, uh, training as well is kind of kind of clustered in a such a way that bring that experience we believe giving the experience 70 percent on the job 20% you know, no kind of coaching for people who need certain behavioral changes and 10% is the classroom session. So it has moved from a maybe 80-20 for about 70-20 and 10. So we, we believe in that, that ratio now. And uh, so I think those have been kind of evolved, not probably something that we, we, we uh, embrace. And you know, working with universities you know, and in, in, in institution, we have learned that uh, that blend is, is quite healthy for us. You want to add anything to that because it touched the how you different methodologies or different approaches to training. Short answer to that. So short answer is obviously uh, you have to have a combination. I, think I agree with Dinesh. So there's mentoring, coaching, then online resources, other ways of uh, and even taking. You know, sometimes you take them on. Um, to a different location, have training camps, you know, outbound kind of training. All these type of trainings are necessary uh, to, you know, get the workforce going. Unfortunately, we have to, everything has to come to an end and this session has to come to an end too. I know that today we've overrun the time because it's a so interesting conversation, so many questions. And uh, to remind the, for the viewers who watch us after recording as well as on the audience, this is about diversity and inclusion topic, generation, working with generations. And uh, today we had two great leaders from one industry and from education background. And uh, my summary, please chip in if I'm not uh, summarizing correctly. Summary is that you need to be cautious. You need to understand there are different generations. I don't think you need to cage people into generation boxes. However, you need to understand, you need to make sure the expectations are met. Uh, as a leader, number one. Number two is that communication is one of the most important thing at, from a leader to these different generations because their expectations are different, they can interpret differently. Number three is that most important thing for a role, for a leader to choose a person is not the generation but the fit for the role. I think these are my three takeaways uh, from the whole conversation. Please add if I miss anything to the conversation. So, 
not to add, but uh, uh, basically what I want from younger generation is to be constantly, uh, to be constantly innovative and be entrepreneurial, right? And that is when we come up with new products, new services and develop new businesses. So I think that is very important for the development of our country, right, as a nation. So, and we are there, whatever that is education or finances or other support, right, to take your ideas to the next level. Add to that, I would say um, everybody need a space in the organization. And leaders, is role is to find that space, create that environment and bring a rewarding and recognition for that space for each one to be part of the larger organization. That connectivity and inclusivity is a, is a key for a, any organization to success. Thank you very much. Uh, those who are watching us, please like us on Facebook and YouTube. And oh, we'll, I have some token of appreciation <laughs> here. Thank you very much. And uh, this goes to yeah. Professor Lalit Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you for your wonderful Thank you. time and Thank speech here. Yeah. Token of appreciation to us. And the next one. It has to be yours, but I love it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Dinesh, thank, thank you so you. much for thank your you. great ideas. Please continue thank with you. your passion. Thank you very much.